In this video, we're going to go over how to find the electric field both inside and outside of an infinite cylinder. So let's say that I have an infinite cylinder. And let's say that its radius is A. It's got some charge density rho inside it. And it's inside, it's also got a permittivity of epsilon naught, so the same as free space. So how do we do this? Well, first question is, how much symmetry do we have? And in particular, do we have enough symmetry to use Gauss's law? And in this case, yes, we do. So we have infinite translational symmetry, so we can use Gauss's law. And so this makes our life a whole lot easier than if we had to do this by brute force integration. So to apply Gauss's law, we first need to pick a Gaussian surface. And I'm going to start with a Gaussian surface. Let's delete some of this charge to make space for it that has a smaller radius than my cylinder of charge. And that's so I can figure out what the electric field is inside the cylinder. So let's say that this has some radius little r, and little r for now is gonna be less than the radius of my cylinder A. The next question is what length should my Gaussian surface cylinder be? I really don't know, and I, I hope that it doesn't matter, so, I'm going to just choose my length to be L. I'm just going to call it L and then hope that it ends up not mattering in the end. So now that we've chosen our Gaussian surface, we, need, we just need to apply Gauss's law. And Gauss's law says that the electric flux is equal to the enclosed charge divided by the permittivity, which here is epsilon naught. And so let's start by finding the flux. And so we can calculate the flux. We know this is just the integral of the electric field over our surface area, or in particular, the electric field of that's pointing out of our Gaussian surface. So this is over our Gaussian surface. And in this case, because we have cylindrical symmetry, our electric field is pointing straight out. So because I have the same amount of charge on the left as I have on the right, my x, the x component, if we call this the x-axis, of the electric field cancels out, and I only have a radial component. Fortunately, that is in the exact same direction as my little dA. So the use of a cylinder is nice here because dA and E are pointing in the same direction, and so E dotted with dA is just equal to E times dA. Now this electric field itself might be a function of the radius. I actually don't know. So I'm going to leave it as E as an unknown function of R. And so to calculate the flux, I just need to multiply E as a function of R, integrate over my surface. Now this, because my electric field is radially symmetric, a at a surface of fixed radius, my electric field is the same everywhere on the cylinder. So I can pull this out of my integral, and I'm just left integrating dA over the Gaussian surface. And this is just my Gaussian surface area, or because this is a cylinder, this is just 2 pi times the radius of my Gaussian cylinder times the length. Now, this is just the flux out of the main body of the cylinder. What about the flux on the two ends of the cylinder? Well, because my area vector is pointing outward in that case, my, the dot product of E, which is pointing radially away, dotted with dA, is zero because they're perpendicular to each other. They're pointing at 90 degrees. So I don't even need to worry about the flux on the ends, which is very nice. Now the last thing we need to do is figure out the enclosed charge inside this Gaussian surface. And so this Gaussian surface is taking up a certain volume. It's this volume inside of my bigger cylinder. And so the amount of charge enclosed is just my charge density, which I'm assuming here is constant because we didn't have this as a function of the radius, times the volume of my Gaussian surface, which here is the volume of a cylinder or pi r squared times its length. So now we just need to set the flux equal to the charge enclosed. 
over epsilon naught. And so we get e as an unknown function of r times 2 pi r l is equal to our charged in our charge enclosed, which is rho times pi r squared l divided by epsilon naught. And so the pi's cancel. One of the r's cancels with this r. And thank goodness the l cancels. I was a little worried about that. And we have a 2. Let's divide both sides by 2. So one half over here. And finally, we've got our electric field. So E as a function of R is rho times R over two epsilon naught. So this is our answer for little r being less than the radius of our cylinder. So our electric field actually increases as we go further and further out from the center while we're inside the cylinder because we're capturing more and more charge. Now what about a radius outside the cylinder? So if we redraw our infinite cylinder, and I'll do my best infinity drawing skills by saying that that goes off to infinity, now we'll want a Gaussian surface that's bigger than this cylinder. So we'll want a Gaussian surface that fully encapsulates the cylinder or that has an, a radius r which is bigger than a. But other than that, the process is exactly the same. So because our electric field is still pointing radially outward because of the cylindrical symmetry here that we have, then we don't have to worry about the ends of this cylinder because the area vector is pointing straight outwards. And we only have to worry about the surface. And just like before, E and DA are pointing in the same direction. So E dot DA is just equal to E times DA. And again, E is some unknown function of R. And so I play the same trick. If I want to find the electric flux, which is gonna be my first step, I integrate E dotted with DA, or I integrate E as a function of R times dA. Now again, because I'm integrating over a surface that has constant r, this is a constant. And so I can pull it out of the integral. So e as a function of r integral dA over my Gaussian surface. And so this is exactly like the case where we had our Gaussian surface being smaller with r smaller than a. It's the same deal. This is still the Gaussian surface area. So this is equal to e of r times 2 pi little r times the length of our Gaussian surface. So l is the length again. And I'm, I'm hoping that this will cancel out with something. Now what about the enclosed charge? So this is a little different than before because our Gaussian surface is fully enclosing all of the cylinder. So the charge that is enclosed is this region. So it's not the volume of our Gaussian surface here that matters, but the volume of our cylinder or the volume of our infinite cylinder. Because if I make my surface bigger or smaller at this point, I'm not capturing any more or less charge as long as it stays bigger than my inside cylinder. And so this is just equal to rho, our constant charge density, times the volume of this inner cylinder, which is pi a squared, because we said that the radius of this cylinder was a times the length of the cylinder. And so applying our same, our favorite trick, the electric flux is equal to the charge enclosed over epsilon naught, Gauss's law, we see that E as some unknown function of the distance from the center times 2 pi little r l is equal to rho times pi a squared l all over epsilon naught. And so as before, one of the pi's cancel, the l, thank goodness, cancels. And if we divide both sides by 2r, we got a 1 over 2r over here now, we get that the electric field as a function of r is rho a squared over 2r epsilon naught, or let's say 2 epsilon naught times r. And so the electric field falls off like 1 over r. 
and this is for r greater than a so our radius we're outside of the cylinder now finally i'd like to thank all my patrons on patreon your support is greatly appreciated and it is you who makes these videos possible if you aren't currently a patron, to get early video access, behind-the-scenes footage, exclusive content, and join a like-minded community, click the link on screen or in the description below. Thanks for watching.